So the problem that we had, uh, that we were discussing last time was about this uh, square domain. We have a square domain and the governing differential equation that was given on that domain was a heat conduction problem, okay? So it was given to us that uh, the domain has the boundary where the temperature is fixed at zero and everywhere in the domain there is a constant heat flux. That is point wise we are applying heat to the entire domain and this Q is the quantity that we've talked about is the heat flux. This is given by minus kappa. Kappa is the conductivity times the gradient of temperature. So this gradient of temperature is a vector quantity. Um, and again, there's a handout for today also. Uh, make sure you have the handout. So once you substitute this into this uh, equation, governing uh, equation, what you get is this. And divergence of grad of a scalar is gives you this equation. This was the equation that we had last time on the um, on the handout. So this is this is called the Laplacian operator. How many of you have seen this Laplacian operator before? Only one? Nobody else? Okay, there are a few who have seen this. Okay, so uh, so this is pretty much from vector calculus. This is um, this is a Laplacian operator, which is going to, when you operate it upon a scalar field, it is going to give you back a scalar. So this is the equation that we want to satisfy everywhere in the domain. And this kind of an equation is also called a Poisson equation. So these are just terminologies that you should be aware of when people uh, who work in finite elements talk about what is a Poisson equation. This is just a Poisson equation. If you remove F, that just becomes the Laplacian equation. Grad uh, or delta square of a scalar term is equal to zero. That's the Laplacian equation. Um, all right. So like we were talking about last time, we saw that this problem has all these planes of symmetry. Okay. So if you uh, you can divide this problem into all uh, these four parts, and then if you notice that there is a diagonal plane of symmetry also, you can actually reduce the problem size to one eighth. And um, the example or the handout that I gave you last time, or actually the example that is there in your books, it is a little more complicated than it actually needs to be. So uh, we'll go over, hopefully, what you should see here is a simpler way to solve that same problem. So um, after, you have, uh, after you've reduced the problem size to 1 8, um, you can actually discretize this with all these different elements. But uh, so here, uh, here I'm also mentioning some symmetry conditions. So one thing that you have to make sure that the problem domain is symmetric with respect to all these arrows. So clearly vertical, horizontal, and both the diagonals, the problem domain is symmetric. The boundary conditions, they are also symmetric with respect to each of those arrows. Um, the, and all the external loads that are applied. So in this case, what is the load? that is being applied. I mean, load is a general term, but sorry. F is the load, and F is constant everywhere in the domain. So F is also symmetric with respect to all these different blue lines. So all these blue lines are axes of uh, symmetry. So um, each of these three has to be uh, satisfied for you to be able to reduce the problem uh, using symmetry. So let's say now we want to solve this different problem with, where the governing equation is the exact same in, uh, in, a sh in a smaller domain, which I'm denoting by omega by 8. So that's the triangular domain. And the boundary conditions are going to change now. Um, so the original boundary condition that we had on this edge, that remains the same. That we are saying that temperature will be maintained at 0 here. But on this edge, on this edge, if you, uh, if you go by symmetry, then uh, you should be able to conclude that the rate of change of theta, the temperature, if you go anywhere across this line, the change in theta should be 0. Does that sound reasonable? This is the temperature. Uh, so the problem is like this. We have uh, applied a 0 temperature everywhere. And we are pumping heat into uh, each and every point of this body. 
So at the edges, we are maintaining a zero temperature, meaning that we are drawing heat, whatever we are pumping in uh, from the in the domain. So after uh, after a certain time has passed, we will have these kinds of uh, iso contours of temperature. So uh, we want to find out what is the temperature distribution in this uh, in this domain. So the final temperature distribution, you should be able to see that because of symmetry, the value of temperature across this line is not going to change, which means that the derivative of theta with respect uh, in this direction is not going to change. So one equation that you get from there is that d theta by dy is zero on edge one to four. The same thing holds here, basically. The temperature across this edge should not change. That's a symmetry condition. So um, that is the condition that holds on this edge. And d theta over dn, this is n is the unit normal vector. OK? So d theta by dn is equal to 0 on edge 1, 3, 6. So that edge is 1, 3, 6. On both, the, both of these edges, the variation of theta perpendicular to that edge should be 0. That's what this is saying. So this is the this is the new boundary condition that we have to solve for if we change our domain to one eighth of the domain. And this is going to be uh, the, uh, this is going to be a similar problem on your homework that I'm going to assign today. Instead of your heat conduction problem, you will be solving a plane stress problem. So you will have to use similar arguments for symmetry there also. Um, all right. So, what do these new what do these new uh, boundary conditions mean? So, if you remember, we said that um, for the heat conduction problem, we are going to take the heat flux, dot it with the unit normal, and we are going to call that quantity uh, edge uh, edge heat flux, which is H. So, what that means is that uh, this red line uh, we are denoting that we are going to either pump in or take out heat from from this edge, and the same thing here. So if you take a look, this Q is equal to minus kappa times gradient of temperature. If you dot that whole thing with N, you get all this. And uh, the quantity gradient of temperature dotted with the no, uh, normal vector, that is this d theta by dn. That means what that denotes is the rate of change of temperature across across an edge which has a normal n. Okay. Um, so if you if you work this out for edge one two four, what is the normal? This is the edge one two four. What is the normal to that edge? What are the components? Nx, Ny, those are the components for the normal, this normal vector pointing outside. Obviously, Nx, there is no component in the x direction, and the y component is minus 1. So this is your N for the edge 1 to 4. And if you take, if you substitute this Nx, Ny into this equation, what you will get is that d theta by dy, this term, has to be equal to 0, which means that H, the applied heat flux is zero. And that is going to take off one, one of the terms from our weak form so that we don't have to evaluate any heat flux. Like uh, in, in elasticity problems, um, one of the problems that I will assign to you, there will be a edge load. And if you, if you can say that H is zero, then you don't have to calculate any loads uh, for that element. Okay. Similarly, for the edge 1, 3, 6, the normal vector, this is the normal vector. This is going to be uh, minus 1 upon square root 2 because it has a negative x component and a positive y component, and the magnitude is 1. So this gives you this relationship, which again means that h, this quantity, q dot n, is 0 on this edge. So both the heat flux. Uh, heat flux quantities are zero on, on this entire edge. So all that you need to do now is to calculate the stiffness matrix for each of these elements and assemble them, enforce the boundary condition on this edge, and that's it. So uh, 
if you take a look at the example in the book, that's a little. Uh, they have they have a lot many lot more quantities floating around in there, but uh, once you go through this, maybe you'll be able to see uh, where all those different quantities come from. So after this, once we have established our strong form and the boundary conditions, we are going to just apply our framework. There's no new uh, thing here. This is the weak form that we have already derived for the heat conduction problem. We are going to express it as theta theta bar. This is the uh, this is the term corresponding to the internal virtual work. This is the external virtual work. And we have just said that H on the entire gamma N, this was, a, this was gamma N, H, has, H is zero on the entire gamma N, okay? So after you have this weak form, all you need to do is to discretize it. And um, So for discretization, we have already seen uh, that we are we are uh, going to use those four triangles uh, for now. And um, once you've discretized it with triangles, you can assume that within each triangle, let's just consider any one triangle. Um, the local node numbers for that triangle are shown inside with blue. Okay, and if you if you use the numbering one, two, three, where two belongs to the right angle, then you know how to uh, you know how to calculate all the shape functions for this. Does anybody know how to calculate the shape functions for this triangle? If I give you the coordinates x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, you can calculate the shape functions. You can calculate the shape function derivatives, and you can calculate uh, so those those shape functions will be n times d. This is also something that you did for your midterm. Um, you can calculate the gradient of the temperature. Uh, that would be B matrix times D. Your element stiffness matrix would be this. Um, would this quantity be constant for the triangle? Beta or B transpose K B, is that constant for this triangle? It is constant because B matrix is all constants. And in this current problem, we have said that K or kappa is identity. So this entire integrand is a constant. It comes out. You don't have to integrate anything. You can straight away code this up uh, in, in MATLAB. Okay. Similarly, you can find out the element force vector. The element force vector is N transpose F, where F is a constant. So F goes out of the integral. And what you're left with is N transpose delta. And we saw that this is nothing but one third area for each of the three nodes, right? So uh, that's what I'm uh, showing here. If kappa is identity, you can express the element stiffness matrix in this form, where for any right angle triangle, if you choose node two at the right angle, then you can express your K element stiffness matrix in this form. And you don't have to memorize this. This is something that you can derive uh, maybe inside five minutes, OK? Um, and then you have all this element force vector. So this element force vector is coming from here. And once again, I'm using that notation that I told you last time. If I have a dark triangle, what that means is that I need, I'm integrating over the domain of the triangle. If I have only the boundary of the triangle, that means I'm integrating along the edge of the triangle. So this term gives rise to this, where we have one third, one third, one third, and the area of the triangle itself is AB over two. That's why we have this F not AB over six. Um, so once you have this element stiffness matrix and element force vector for each of, uh, for each of those triangles, it will actually uh, turn out if you calculate for all of those triangles, so this was the mesh that we were using. We have this triangle, one, a little uh, oriented in a mirror image way, uh, element two, element three, and element four. So just like in the one-dimensional case, if you have the element of the same size, same, uh, same Young's modulus and all that, then all the element stiffness matrices came out to be same. Did you rem do you remember from your three-noded uh, linear element? In this case also, you have the same size triangles, 
and this triangle 2 is a little uh, oriented in the other way. But even then, all the four stiffness matrices for all the four elements turn out to be this, this matrix that I just told you about, right here. And if you plug in A is equal to B uh, is equal to half, I think. Right, so if you plug in A is equal to B is equal to half, where the value of A is the dimension of that square, uh, 2A is the dimension of that square. So A is equal to 1, that's why we are choosing these values. You get K element, force element. There's nothing uh, very tricky about this, but uh, all these four elements, stiffness matrices and force vectors will turn out to be the same. And at this stage, what should we do? We have found out all the uh, element stiffness matrices. Now what? We go ahead and assemble them into a global uh, stiffness matrix. And how, what is the dimension of the global stiffness matrix? Six by six, because there are six nodes. Four elements and six nodes, right? So this is the global stiffness matrix. All, you're, all we are doing here is, for element one, we, uh, we take this matrix and put it into the right position. For element two, put it in the right position, and that's it. So this is your global element stiffness matrix that you get after assembling all of the four element stiffness matrices. <laughs> and the same thing happens for, uh, for the force vector. So if you see, these are these 1, 3, 3, and 1, 3, 1. Those are the quantities that are coming from, um, from this force term. And let me say right here that this term is 0. Um, but those, that term is zero only for, uh, for these edges, these red edges. It is not zero at this edge. Can anybody tell me why this is not zero at that edge? Say it again. Yeah, so the temperature applied on that uh, edge is zero. And we cannot maintain a zero temperature at that edge unless we take out heat. Because we are pumping heat into the entire domain, we have to take it out somewhere. So H, that boundary term, is not going to be zero at this place. But that's not a problem because that is just going to come out later as a quote-unquote reaction. Just like in structures, we have applied forces and specified displacements, and we have uh, we compute reactions after you uh, after you solve that problem. So in this case, you have six cross six matrix, and the three degrees of freedom are, which are the three degrees of freedom? So uh, this is the global stiffness matrix. I have to divide that into free and specified parts, right? Which are the three degrees of freedom? Temperature at node one, node two, and node three. They are the three degrees of freedom. Temperature at four, five, six has been specified to be equal to zero. Theta at four, five, and six is specified to be zero. So these, these three right here, they are the three degrees of freedom. And let's say these three, they are the specified. So specified, specified, and free, free. So in this case, you don't even have to rearrange the equations to, uh, to come up with this sort of a decomposition. If you just divide it into a 3 cross 3, you will, you will get this matrix. Now, I just told you that the unknown temperature at 4, 5, 6, that, that is the specified temperature that, that is 0. So if you take a look at the first row, what do we get from the first row? KFF times the unknown temperatures at, one, um, at uh, 1, 2, and 3. So that's right here. K times KFF times DF. On the left side, on the right side, you have FF, which is the three degrees of freedom at these three nodes. And that you can immediately read off from here. Those are all known. Okay, so these are like applied loads or known applied loads uh, to your problem. 
So finally, if you s try to solve this equation, it boils this six down, six cross six boils down to a three cross three. Your unknown temperatures at these three degrees of freedom are here. You solve this equation, you find that this is these are the temperatures at these three nodes, and that's basically the entire procedure for solving um, solving a problem of heat conduction using these triangular elements. Um, so one, the, prob the problem just doesn't get over at this stage. Uh, what do you think? Uh, how will I find out the value of the temperature, let's say, at the centroid of element one? How do I find that out? Now that I have the temperatures at all these different places, I have the temperature at one, two, three, four, five, six. I know the temperature at all the nodes, right? The temperature at uh, one, two, three is here. Temperature at four, five, six is zero. How do I find out the temperature at the centroid of this uh, of this triangle? What should I do if I want to find that out? Uh, so you're saying that just take the average of these three. Um, that will work for the centroid of this element. How about, uh, let's say, something that is not at the centroid, right? Exactly. So if you choose the shape functions that give you the approximate value of the temperature anywhere in that uh, triangle, okay? That is the purpose of the, uh, that is the entire purpose of the shape function. Once you know the value at the nodes, you can interpolate your value of the temperature anywhere in the element. So uh, that's how you would find the value of the temperature anywhere uh, in this domain. And then you can go back and replicate this triangle once to get a square, replicate that square four times to get the entire domain. So that's also a part of what is called post computation. Your problem just doesn't stop here. Once you have found out D, you have to go back and calculate all the rest of the quantities. Okay. Um, so what are all these quantities? Q5, Q6, uh, 4, 5, 6. These are the reactions or the amount of heat flux that we need to pull out from nodes 4, 5, and 6 to keep uh, this current temperature profile. So that's like the reaction uh, at that edge. Um, and then, um, so that's the reactions at those uh, edges. And similarly, you can also calculate the temperature and the temperature gradient at, uh, within each element. So just like we, I was asking you about the shape functions, you use the shape functions to input, interpolate the value of the temperature at any point. You can also find the gradient of the temperature at any point in the, in the domain. So what would be the value of the gradient of temperature, let's say some point here, not necessarily the, uh, not necessarily the centroid? How do I do that? So you just told me that you can use your shape functions to interpolate the temperature between uh, nodes one, two, and three. We can use the shape function derivatives, which are these B matrices, to calculate the temperature gradient at any location. So, okay, here's the another question. Um, what is, uh, is the value of temperature gradient, let's say some point here versus some point here within the same element? Is that going to be same or different? Same because B matrix is a constant. So what that means is the temperature gradient for that entire triangle is a constant value, a constant vector. What is, what is the dimension of this vector going to be? What is the size of that vector or matrix? Gradient of theta, which you can calculate as B multiplied with D. Two by one, because this is a heat conduction problem. So the dimension of the B matrix is uh, two cross three, right? And D is three cross one. So two cross one, that is the gradient of temperature. Um, so this is basically how you would set up your entire uh, problem in heat conduction. I'm uh, going to assign a similar problem for, uh, for the 2D uh, plane elasticity. That is also something that we'll talk about in a little bit. 
but let's take a look at how you would solve this problem now with rectangular elements. So in this case, if you want to use rectangular elements, then you actually cannot use this diagonal line of symmetry because that would leave you with a triangular domain. Um, so you end up using on fourth symmetry, uh, and uh, if you focus in on this part of the this part of the domain, then you can discretize that part of the domain with these four elements, these four rectangular elements. Um, so. Um, in this case, your shape function matrix will have four shape functions, just like the way that we talked about last time. These are bilinear shape functions. These are not linear. And therefore, the B matrix will not be constant. It will have a linear X term, and it will have a linear Y term, which means that uh, uh, so you would have to do actual integration for calculating your stiffness matrices. And last time we also looked at this. How do we calculate the shape functions and uh, the derivatives and all that for, for a rectangular element? And uh, just to uh, let you know that this is a very, very special case of a rectangular element. These are not very helpful. Are, these are not very useful, except for if you want to sh uh, solve some small problems by hand. Okay. So these are the kinds of questions, again, you could get on the homework, which you will and uh, maybe even on the exam. But in reality, in reality, the quadrilateral element, which uh, the general quadrilateral element, which can be oriented anyway in X and Y, that is more useful rather than this rectangular element. But let's take a look at how we would, we would solve this problem with the rectangular element. So we said that shape function 1 should go to 1 at node 1 and 0 everywhere else. And that could be written out as a product of one dimensional shape functions. So if you do that, you will see that the shape function one is this. Just plug in x is equal to zero, y is equal to zero in here. You will get minus a times minus b, that is ab over ab, so it becomes one. Everywhere else, two, three, four, one of these terms will go to zero, meaning that n1 goes to zero at everywhere else. So the same concept is valid for uh, shape function for node 2, node 3, node 4. They all go to 1 at their node and 0 everywhere else. And you can see that they are not linear. There is a quadratic x times y term in each one of those. OK? Um, all right, so that's, that's how you would calculate the shape functions for a element, for a rectangular element which has sides a and b. And in our case, it is, the, we have four square elements actually. Uh, because this is a square domain of side 2a. So this total side length is a equal to 1. And the side length for each of those elements is a is equal to b is equal to half. Okay. Um, so once you have these shape functions, you can find the derivatives. So how do we get this? n1, comma 1. What is what does that mean? Derivative of shape function 1 with respect to x. That's n1, comma 1. So if you take that derivative, this term goes away, y minus b over ab. So the same thing happens for all the shape functions. This top row is derivative with respect to x of all these four shape functions. This bottom row is derivative of all these shape functions with respect to y. And if you plug, uh, if you take this entire thing, that is your B matrix. So it, uh, if you remember from the triangular case, your B matrix was just the first three elements of this. Obviously, the shape functions were different, but you just had N1, N2, and N3. Um, here, since there are four nodes, we have four columns. In general, if you have five nodes, six nodes, whatever, you keep on adding. Uh, those uh, those columns here. Um, so once again, once you have your B matrix, you can go ahead and calculate K element, where again this uh, this integral that I'm showing you is over the domain of the square, and um, B matrix is not constant. This is not constant, so you actually cannot pull this out of the integral. You would have to do you would have to do a double integral, which is what I'm showing you here. And if you go ahead and uh, try to take this matrix uh, 
and this this calculation actually you can use MATLAB to do. And if you uh, uh, for your homework problem that is I'm saying, um, you can calculate this. Take a look at how I set up the uh, the calculation for the three noded element in the solution for homework three. You can set this integral up using symbolics, and you will get um, you you will get a four cross four element stiffness matrix in this case, which looks like this. Similarly, you have your element force vector, the same terms, n transpose f naught, um, and in this case, uh, the area of each element is one. So the load at each of those four nodes, load at each of those four nodes is going to be one by four, one by four, and so on. So that's your force vector for each element. And once again, for all the four, four elements, the stiffness matrix and the element force vector is exactly the same. So once you have found out your element stiffness matrix and element force vector, you go ahead and assemble your systems. Uh, what is the size of this system going to be? Nine cross nine. So because we have nine nodes, that's your nine degrees of freedom the system will be 9 cross 9. Your unknown temperatures, they are going to be a vector of 9 cross 1. Your unknown force vector, that is also 9 cross 1. Um, so which of the, f uh, which are the degrees of freedom that are free and specified? I have to reduce this global equation by, uh, by enforcing boundary conditions now, right? So how do I enforce boundary conditions, which are the specified degrees of freedom and the free degrees of freedom? So 7, 8, 9, and 3, and 6, all these degrees of freedom, they are specified, right? On, on this entire edge, we know that the temperature needs to be zero. That leaves these four degrees of freedom that are free, which means that if you pick out those four degrees of freedom here, let's say these four degrees of freedom here and these four degrees of freedom here, that will give you the four cross four free matrix that you need to solve just like this. Um, and if you do that, you will get your, uh, you will get your temperature temperatures at, at all these four nodes. So, okay, so how, uh, how about uh, if we compare the temperatures that we got from the triangular case, if you remember the triangular case was this, if I compare the temperature at node one, node two, and node five to the triangular case, uh, what do you think? Will it be equal to that? Does it have to be equal to that or does it or may not be equal to that? What do you think? It will be close, yeah, that's correct. Uh, but uh, yeah, it will not be equal. In general, uh, it will not be equal. Uh, as you refine the mesh, either in the triangular case or this, this rectangular case, you will get closer and closer to the exact solution, but uh, those answers are not going to match in general. So um, all right, so after that, you all you have to do is to do some post computation. You can calculate the uh, heat fluxes that, that you need to pull out from the boundary, that is the reactive forces. Uh, and similarly, you can calculate the temperature and the temperature gradient anywhere in the domain using your shape functions for interpolation. Okay, so any question on this problem? Uh, how do uh, any of these steps, hopefully you, you can see how we are trying to solve all these problems. We start with a governing equation. Uh, we try to reduce our domain using symmetry. Once we reduce our domain, we have to find new boundary conditions. Once you find your new boundary conditions, we use our weak form. Uh, you substitute your finite element approximation into that. And then um, you, uh, you calculate your element stiffness matrices, element force vector, assemble them, and you uh, solve them. OK? So this is pretty much the entire uh, process of solving uh, any problem with a finite element formulation. It, it can be heat conduction, elasticity, whatever. So let's take a look at the problem that I'm going to assign you today for 
for this is for the hand calculation part. <coughs> so this is a square domain. Again, side is two. This is an elasticity problem. This is not a heat conduction problem. It is fixed at this one point, and it is at a roller edge on the other two. And I'm applying a constant traction, T. So traction is, uh, in two dimensions, it is a force per unit length because we are assuming that the thickness into the thickness into the plane is unity is one so this traction t is uh, a force per unit length that is being applied on this edge in this in this direction and this direction so uh, the strong form or the governing differential equation same old equation that we had divergence of stress plus body force is equal to zero uh, this here is a vector equation in two dimensions uh, this is not a uh, th for the heat conduction problem we had a scalar equation just one equation here how many equations do we have y3 two two equations because this is a two dimensional problem we have two components x and y and this stress stress is a two cross two matrix uh, you can represent the stress with a two cross two matrix and if you take the divergence of that stress, that is going to give you back a 2 cross 1 vector. So that entire thing is a 2 cross 1 vector. This body force, body force is bx, by. That's also a 2 cross 1 vector. And right hand side, 0, that is also a 2 cross 1 vector, 0 and 0. Um, so let's take a look at the boundary conditions. This is different from all the problems that we've been trying to solve uh, till now a little bit. Um, on this edge, we are saying that the displacement in the U2 direction, which is y, y displacement has to be zero on this gamma D1. On this gamma D2, we are saying that U1 displacement in the X direction has to be zero. Um, so what, what we are saying essentially is that in terms of a vector equation, the displacement in the x direction on this edge can be something that is unknown we need to find it out we, we need to solve for it but the displacement in the y direction has to be zero along this edge that's your right that's your equation right here we also know that we we need to specify either the displacement or the traction at every point along the boundary so since we are not specifying the displacement here we have to specify the traction at this location which means that there is no traction in the x direction. That is valid because uh, these are all rollers. So if you apply any traction, uh, it cannot resist any traction in this direction. So it can have an unknown displacement in the x direction and a zero traction in this direction. On this edge, similarly, uh, zero traction and an unknown displacement in the y direction on this edge and known displacement and unknown traction uh, in the x direction. So this is uh, this kind of a boundary condition. Uh, it it is not a displacement boundary condition uh, or a traction boundary condition. And if you remember from the heat conduction problems that we were talking about, we don't even call this a mixed boundary condition. This this you can call as a hybrid boundary condition where one component of one component of the vector uh, is. So let let me ask you this: What is the first row of this is that a displacement boundary condition or a traction boundary condition the first row so that would be a traction boundary condition unknown displacement specified traction the second row is a displacement boundary condition where uh, we are specifying the displacement but tractions we need to find from the reactions and the opposite thing happens on gamma d2 okay so uh, this kind of a boundary condition is something that we call when we are addressing different components of a vector field we call that kind of a boundary condition a hybrid boundary condition and similarly for the other two edges those are not bad at all uh, the traction on gamma n1 this is gamma n1 the traction is specified to be zero in the x direction and t in the y direction attraction on gamma n2 is specified to be uh, zero in the y direction there is no traction in the y and t in the x direction all right so here's the question um, 
now I'm asking you to solve this problem with finite elements uh, using some sort of symmetry arguments or however many elements you want to decompose it with. Uh, I'm asking you to use triangular elements. Um, so do you think there is any symmetry in this problem? Any, yeah, so diagonal, there is a symmetry. Um, so which is this plane right here. Is this diagonal symmetry? Um, any other symmetries? So there are no other symmetries, which means that uh, you can divide your domain or you can reduce your domain to half its original size. That's your new uh, new domain. Okay. Uh, but what would be the boundary condition on the new domain? So if we just concentrate on this part of the triangle, we can use this boundary condition as it is. We can use this boundary condition as it is. How about the boundary condition on this this edge? What would be that? What would uh, what would be a correct uh, form of the boundary condition on this edge? Say that again. Right is going to be zero. So u is a vector. It is going to have two. Uh, it is it is going to have two directions, x and y. Uh, but what we are saying is that this line cannot displace perpendicular to its any point that is along this line cannot displace perpendicular to itself. That is, u dot with n has to be equal to zero. And what that means is that we can represent this line with rollers. Does that make sense? Can I represent this line with rollers if I'm saying that there is supposed to be no displacement in this direction? Which, basi which basically means that uh, uh, if, if this line is rollers, then the only displacement that this, this will allow will be along the tangent uh, at this slope. OK? Um, so let me just pull out the other. Uh, this is what it would look like. Your uh, um, and this is, I think, not in your handouts, so uh, you can just draw this picture separately. Um, so you have this uh, new problem domain, and we are saying that this rollers uh, would be the edge, if this new edge that would be formed. Okay. Um, all right. So um, this triangle you can actually decompose with constant strain triangles. This, these are four triangles once again, just like the way that we had for our, uh, for our heat conduction problem. But if you were to draw the uh, degrees of freedom at each node now, so the node numbers, I think, were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Um, we know that. Uh, the degrees of freedom in this two-dimensional problem, we have two degrees of freedom at each node. Um, so these are the two degrees of freedom at uh, all those nodes. Um, so we know how to calculate all the element stiffness matrices and element force vectors for, for these types of triangles. Even though this is a vector problem, we know um, uh, how to calculate all the k element and the f element for all this. But in the end, what would be the size of the global? Uh, let's say you calculate all your k elements, and you want to assemble your global stiffness matrix. That would be k global times d global is equal to f global. What would be the size of uh, this k global? Right. So there are six nodes, two degrees of freedom each. You have 12 cross 12. Um, how many? How many specified degrees of freedom are there? How many free degrees of freedom are there? So let me mark the specified degrees of freedom with this red. Um, both the x and y are constrained at this node, right? So both of those goes away. These are specified. Uh, the y degree of freedom is specified here. The y degree of freedom is specified here. How about these two now?
what do we do about these two? Is X specified or is Y specified or what? They are equal, but if you remember, we need to uh, we need to uh, decompose this matrix into free and specified parts, right? So how do we go about doing that? No. Um, so, all right. So let's take a look at how we would do that. Um, let's consider this D vector. This is a 12 cross 12. Uh, sorry, this is a 12 cross 1 vector. And the particular degrees of freedom that we are worried about are 3, the degrees of freedom with node 3, and degrees of freedom with node 6. So, um, what would be the number of degrees of freedom uh, in this global vector for 3 and 6? So the degrees of freedom corresponding to node 3 will be 5 and 6, right? If you go with 1, um, if you go with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, okay? So the degrees of freedom are going to be 5 and 6 for node 3 and 11 and 12 for, uh, for node 6. Now what we want to do is basically transform the degrees of freedom from this xy coordinates to, um, to this coordinate along the, uh, which is oriented along this slope. And if we transform these degrees of freedom, let's say this is 5 and 6 to let's say 5 prime, 6 prime, then we can enforce our boundary condition by saying that 6 prime needs to be 0. Okay? And how do we do that? How do I transform these specific degrees of freedom, let's say u5, u6, uh, to by an angle theta, which is in this case 45 degrees? So you will have, again, that transformation matrix, right? So uh, we have this D5, D6. Let me call this prime, prime. That would be equal to cosine, sine, minus sine, cosine. And old D5, D6. And uh, the same thing would be valid for your degrees of freedom 11 and 12. So if I multiply uh, these entire degrees of freedom by a big transformation matrix right here, this transformation matrix is this 4 cross 4 here, and this 4 cross 4 here, Everywhere else, it is one meaning identity. So this is a transformation matrix that you would apply to your global global stiffness uh, matrix. So what would the new uh, what would the new global equation look like? It would look like k global transformation matrix transpose transformation matrix d global. So all I'm doing here is uh, arranging terms a little differently. T times side and side global. Okay. So what I've done by multiplying this, uh, if you if you take this quantity right here, that would be transport uh, this transformation matrix transpose times itself, and that will come out to be identity. So we have not changed our global stiffness equation. And uh, what we have done now is just transformed these specific, these specific two degrees of freedom from, from direction 5 and 6 to direction 5 prime and 6 prime. And similarly, we have changed this direction 11 and 12 to 11 and 12 in this direction. So now uh, for this, for this 12 cross 12 system, we can enforce our boundary condition that says that uh, this 6 prime needs to be 0 and, and this 12 prime needs to be 0. 
So, so uh, what we will have left would be two, four, uh, the degrees of freedom at two and four in the x direction, and degrees of freedom five prime, 11 prime, and these two. So that would be a six cross six that would be left. So this is something that you would have to do by hand uh, for, for the homework problem that I'll assign today. And we don't have enough time to talk about the code, but we'll do that on Monday. Yeah? Question? Right, because node one is constrained by this edge anyway. So we don't have to worry about that. Okay? All right, so I'll see you guys on Monday.